please join me in welcoming Sister Claire Hunter. It is a pleasure to, to be here, and um, I, I am grateful to have the sisters here. Um, I think some of you have met us throughout the diocese. Sometimes we go touring to your parishes to see how Catholic you are. And, um, and uh, I did bring uh, Sister Judith, who works at Fair... Don't, do not raise your hand, though, if you've met Sister Judith at Fairfax Sinova Gastrointestinal Unit. I actually often will do a talk and a, a spouse will nudge the other spouse and say, remember we saw her when you got your colonoscopy? So my favorite story of her though is when, she wears white when she, we go, when she's at work. And so the poor people who wake up from anesthesia to see a white figure kind of hovering. I've been begging her to wear black sometimes to help with evangelization purposes and um, bringing more people to Jesus. So we're gonna still work on, on that. Um, so if you do have a gastrointestinal question, she's over here in the <laughs> beige sweater. Uh, Sister Catherine is also with me, and Sister Catherine works at the priest retirement home, the, the St. Rosa of Lima Villa. Um, so, I, I, there's, um, so if you have any questions about the retired priest, but that is also where Bishop Laverty will eventually reside when he retires. Um, it, it has been a pleasure for me to work for the, with the diocese now for nine years, um, and really the opportunity, I think I've spoken at many of your parishes, and I already apologize, some of you may have heard parts of this talk. Um, it'll be a little different because first of all, I'm not capable of giving the same talk twice, and um, which is not actually a gift. It's really like the problem, I can't give a talk same <laughs> twice. Um, but also, it, looking at now, um, we're gonna talk today a little bit about St. Martha, um, one of my favorite characters from scripture, and really looking now through the lens of this, this gift of mercy. Um, and without hopefully maybe being too self-revealing, um, you know, I do look oftentimes at my own reflections of, of the mystery of mercy, of the mystery of our relationship to Christ, of my relationship to Christ. And I, I think, I don't know about you, but I, if, you know, maybe this doesn't apply to you, you know, you can apply, but I often really feel um, panicked that I'm not perfect yet. I, I, I really am that sister. I think maybe it's a generational thing too. Maybe it's something, um, but I really do, like I, I sort of have always sort of bought the, the, the idea that saints basically have like one minute, they meet Jesus and then they're perfect. And, and which is silly because I clearly know, you know, there's 20 years I reread, except for like St. Therese, who I always think the ones that die young, we sh they don't get a lot of, sorry Therese, but I don't think we should give them a lot of, um, I mean, how hard was their life, really? They died at like 22. <laughs> If I died at 22, I probably was probably better then. No, um, I know, so I, I always pick on St. Therese, and some, one day when it, somebody asked me, what are you gonna do when you see her in heaven? <laughs> you are really hard on her. And I was like, well, I probably won't get there for a while, so I have time. Um, but really, I am sort of the sister who plants the grass seed and goes out the next day to see if it's up. You know, a five minute microwave meal is really too long. and. Um, and you know, my, my retreat, I usually have it planned that by Wednesday, I should probably be pretty perfect and um, God should be asking my opinion on how to run most things. Um, and so there's always this, you know, sort of this beating myself up a bit more about why aren't I there yet? And I, I really am becoming more and more to understand really what sort of the gifts I'm missing by by approaching my faith that way, and by looking to this idea that it's something to get over, something to sort of finish up and get kind of perfect. And really this, this mystery where the gift of constant conversion, that gift of constantly growing in intimacy with Christ. And I, I love the, so many of our saints, um, but I think scripture gives us such a rich look at these men and women who quite frankly saw the face of Jesus saw his face when we, we this this document on the year of mercy is the face of mercy um misericordia voltus and and we look we're talking about men and women who not only see the face of christ but don't get it right and and i don't know about you but there's always sort of a a, a part of me that's like phew and if peter can't get it then i'm i'm looking good i'm looking pretty good you know and i love saint martha well first of all i, I grew up catholic so i didn't read the bible and um so <laughs> 
luckily, actually, this is so bad, I gave a talk, and I made that comment, but before I had given the talk, a woman introduced herself, and she said I was Lutheran, and so usually, in the U.S., who know I give talks, I often love to have audience participation. We won't do that today, because it's just a big group. So she told me she was a convert, so I asked a question, and she answered it from Scripture, and I, I'm, I felt so bad. I was like, she knows that because she wasn't Catholic, and I really, and I was like, oh, that sounds terrible. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't mean to call you out that you converted, and that was embarrassing. But she did know all the answers when I brought up scripture. But I have to say, because I grew up Catholic, didn't know scripture as well as probably many of our other brothers and sisters in, in Christianity, Christian faith. Um, it's, been a, it's been a beautiful time now in my life to really discover um, scripture, to spend more time in these years reading the gospel stories. And, and part of it really, this sounds, again, to sort of tell myself, but part of it was sort of like, I started to realize it looked bad that I didn't know the full scripture story. Or I didn't like parts of the story, so I didn't listen to the whole part of it. Um, I, don't, I know none of you have ever done that, but like the prodigal son, I can't stand that story because I'm the oldest, and I'm like, he shouldn't have come back. I, I'm so <laughs> mad. The other one, I can't stand. I know. I know. I mean, I struggle with, I shouldn't say I can't, I struggle with, is um, the vineyard, the workers in the vineyard, who do, they all get different pay. I, know, I just check out. I'm like, I'm not listening. It's not fair. I hate that story. And what I noticed, too, and I, you were going to talk about this a little bit with, with, um, with St. Martha, is I only listen to parts of the story I kind of either like or prove my point. You know, and I think we all do that. Like, we all love the part that Jesus ate with sinners. We're like, well, well I'm good then. So, um, so I do want to take this time today a little bit to do a bit of a, I, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't go so far as call it Alexio Divina, but sort of an opportunity for us to look more practically um, at the life of St. Martha and to really actually look at, first of all, what really the, the gospel says, like what the whole story is, not sort of the gist of the story for us. Um, but before we do that, I also want to just touch on um, a reminder of what the gift of mercy, this year of mercy, is really about. Um, you know, this is a, very personal, but I, I, well, I went to confession. <laughs> That's personal. I think, yeah, yeah. But I went um, on Wednesday because the light was on for me. And so <laughs> I, I was at confession. And I, it had been three couple weeks, and they hadn't been the best weeks. I just kind of, you know, like those times when you're like, nothing, like no major new sins, but I was just like really in a bad mood about them all. I'm like, ah, I got to get this over with. And of course, I, so I've gone to confession since whatever, seven, seven years old, eight years old, and I honestly am very privileged. I've never had a bad confession. I mean, no, meaning like confessor. I should, I, yeah, I've had plenty of bad confessions. <laughs> Sorry about that, but a confessor. I've never had anyone say anything harsh. I've never had a priest um, not be really attentive. I mean, maybe a little boring in his response, but still, they've all been really a good experience. And for whatever reason on Wednesday night, I don't know what happened in me but I kind of, when I ended, I, I, this is so interesting. I'm so stunned by it. I expected him to yell at me. I don't know why I thought that. I just, I, because I think I felt so bad about just sort of not being perfect yet in the same stuff. And I was sort of bracing myself for him to be like, come on, sister, get it together. <laughs> what, you've been in 23 years. You, sh you should have this down now. Because that's how I felt. And he, was, he started by saying, I'm so glad you're here. And he went into this, this beautiful, very simple, you know, this is what life is about. It's about this constantly trying the daily life. Clearly, it's not going to be perfect. But as a consecrated woman, you are being called to, to, to give your life to Christ and, and to seek his mercy. And the way he just spoke to me, and I really was overcome with just this, he's the heart of Christ. He is speaking to me. This is Jesus talking. And it was sort of a, a reminder of like, I think I treat God that way too. I sort of do this distance of like, you can't possibly love me or really even want to look at me quite frankly because I don't even want to look at me sometimes. And I don't want to sort of like face, it's like just the day-to-day -day stuff that I know I'm not doing well with that I know I, I should be, I know I could be. And so for me, this year of mercy isn't so much, I, I'm coming growing in my understanding of it. it's not so much like I'm bad we're bad we got to go and ask for get mercy and be forgiven and forgive others because they're bad we kind of get stuck in that 
And especially, I think, you know, Pope Francis speaks so beautifully about just opening um, the, the document, um, a Misericordiae Voltus, just with a reminder, first of all, that um, Jesus Christ, who is a person, is a person, is the face of the Father's mercy. And, you know, it's interesting, I, I, I think some of us, you know, as we're reading the Psalms, if we have different Bible or different translations or even in our breviary, um, mercy and love is also syn often synonymous. So, for instance, in the Psalms like 136 or 118, it talks about, you know, God's, you know, blessed be God, you know, his mercy endures forever. In some translations, it's his love endures forever. They, it switches. And so we have this constant reminder of that the word is synonymous, mercy and love, which changes it, right? Because, you know, we don't usually go, well, I'm, I messed up, now I have to go get love from somebody. You know, usually it's, I've got to get, I've got to ask mercy, you know, and, and, but to think about that, I have to go seek their love, to, to really change that mind frame for us. Um, also, you know, just Pope Francis kind of defines what mercy is in, in four ways in, in, the, in the document, and it's interesting because it wasn't what I expected. Again, I expected because of our great sinfulness, we have to go ask God and get his mercy for forgiveness. But he, the first one is mercy is the word, the, the word that reveals the mystery of the most holy trinity. So mercy is something that reveals God to us, not just a forgiveness. It also is the ultimate and supreme act by which God comes to meet us. And we're going to talk about that, him coming to meet us, because that, that is what we long for. That's what we long for in any relationship we have, to be met as we are and, 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 to, and, and to be with an other. It is the fundamental law that d dwells in the heart of every person who looks sincerely into the eyes of his brothers and sisters on the path of life. And I think, again, more and more I'm just thinking of this face-to-face -face encounter when you look, can look someone in the eyes and, 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 and address them and, and be with them. And how much we're losing that with our virtual world, huh? with our cell phones and with our computers. Um, I'm noticing more and more young people not capable of having a conversation and just looking eye to eye w with me. And then this is the one I, I really personally love the most. Mercy is the bridge. It's a bridge that connects God and man, opening our hearts to the hope, to the hope of being loved forever despite our sinfulness. And again, that's sort of an experience I had with, um, with confession the other night. Now, St. Martha. Um, I, I'm not a biblical scholar, um, so I, I beg, borrow, and steal from different pieces, and also some of it's my own opinion, and um, I'm, go, I'm gonna go with it. Um, no, but I, I do wanna say, as, as we talk about Martha a little bit today, just to kinda go d a little deeper into um, this, this family, this family of friends. They're the only reference to friendship of Jesus in the scriptures. The apostles, you know, he talks about them as friends, but, um, you know, the, the, the reminder the apostles are from a group of disciples, of followers, and at one time we have Jesus goes away to the mountain to pray and comes back and says who the 12 are. So I kind of go with God told him he had to pick them. And um, so they weren't, which is fine, they work out in the end, but um, they weren't sort of of his own volition of like, who do I like best, who, you know, who, who makes me laugh more. It's really these men have this mission, and it's really, as we well know, has nothing to do with their qualifications. In fact, thank God, because they would never have made it, um, which I think all of us can say too. Um, most of what we do in our life, really, and, and the way in which God asks us to serve him as disciples in, in mission as women of faith, usually we're not, is not our expertise sometimes, it, we notice. We're really called to do things that stretch us, that bring us out of ourselves, um, which is really the gift of our faith. I mean, you know, I think it was Carol Hauslander has a wonderful um, part in her book on the read of God, just reminding us that, the, the, that God didn't ask Mary to do anything par spectacular. He didn't say, I need you to go learn a few languages to become an expertise and expert in, in you know, um, spinning wool and being capable of running a farm. He didn't say any of these things. I need, I need you to be a, a scripture scholar so that you can teach my son scripture. He basically says, do you have faith in me and will you let something to be done unto you? And so, you know, we really have this mystery of discipleship that's allowing God to do something to us, for us. Um, so St. Martha is part, is part of a, a normal, um, wonderful, holy, and dysfunctional family. Um, she... Some scripture scholars, and I, I, I think this flows, um, really look at Mary, Ma at Mary, this his, her sister Mary of Bethany, as being Mary Magdalene, 
the one in which we don't know exactly. She, we sometimes we talk about her as maybe a prostitute or at least a woman, um, sort of a loose woman of the world. Um, she's what referred to oftentimes as one that Jesus removed seven demons from or seven something. So it's clearly, it's clearly they, they're, they're sort of known as a, maybe a family of means. The one reason we might even say that is, first of all, she's throwing a lot of banquets for Jesus and his disciples. So it's certainly not a, a poor family. But as we, as we look at the fact that you know, when Lazarus dies, even it, there's the town comes out. You know, they're they're a well-known family, um, but there's no proof. I you know, I can't prove to you that they're they're rich, but they're certainly a family of means, and they're a family that Jesus loves to spend time with. Um, but but obviously, there's a lot of, spe- of of issues. I I can only imagine the tension between Martha and Mary, um, especially if Mary Magdalene has left the family for some time, maybe been a cause of scandal. And then we have Lazarus, Lazarus who. Um, I heard a priest, one talk, a priest once talk about him as the spoiled younger brother. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's going to work for me And um, if I talk. But also, you know, as we, as we look at this with Scripture, sometimes I think it's important for us, as we're going to read a story about, um, you know, even one that might make us uncomfortable, to think of some of the context that goes into this, and a constant reminder that they're human, and they're from a family life, similar, and from a culture, as we are. Um, St. Martha, by the way, and her family, I mean, is a, is a very good woman. She's a faithful woman. She's a, a very good Jew. Um, she, probably like a lot of us here, um, wants to practice her faith and wants that to, to be good in, in, in trying to do this. She also um, knows her faith and her teachings. Not all of them. In, as we know, Jesus is going to challenge her on some things, and she's going to need to grow in that. Um, She's clearly someone who is capable of, of running things. She's, she's the one that's always going out to meet Jesus, which means she probably was in charge of this household. And when we think about what she does, each story we're going to talk about, quite frankly, she's doing exactly what she's supposed to be doing. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. She's not, she's not doing anything ex- extraordinary. You know, she's going to serve a meal. She's mourning her brother's death. Um, she's a very practical woman, um, and she's, she's clearly very capable, and someone Jesus really trusts to, to, make, to, to, to allow him and his apostles to come and spend time with them and, and, to, and to feed them. Um, and, and most importantly, I think something is she has a very personal relationship with Jesus. It says very clearly in Scripture, now Jesus loves Martha and Mary and, and Lazarus. He, 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 she, she knows him well. Um, now, Oftentimes, and some of you know this, um, when I give this talk, I, I will have some participation, and I will test your biblical knowledge. And, and it's always, it always works really well, because typically the audience is wrong in what the answer is. So that kind of always helps my talk. I'm going to be re- Now, though, I'm going to have to not do the talk anymore, because you're all going to get this right. So when I go to your parish, you're going to answer the right way, and it's going to just blow my talk. But I'm going to paraphrase um, in, my, in my version of the story of Martha and Mary. Okay, um, so Martha's the one that serves, by the way. Someone's like, one of them served and one was at the feet. So we remember that Martha's the one that serves. And the gist of the story is she has to do everything by herself. She tells Jesus to make Mary help her. Jesus yells at her and says he loves Mary better. Right? I mean, come on. Who are we kidding? And so we're all like, because every one of us in this room are like, we serve a lot. (laughs) And if my sister was sitting and doing nothing, which I'm sure has never happened at Thanksgiving, right? (laughs) There's always the sister-in-law that never helps with dishes. (laughs) But we don't ever talk about her that way. (laughs) We always think, that's nice that she could sit and watch TV with that. Okay, so first of all, let's get the story correct, all right? Okay, first of all, just a reminder that, and I I just think this is so important, this is kind of daily life. This is not extraordinary. Jesus goes, you know, we know at least is is free and going to Bethany, and she's going to serve a meal. And, And by the way, she's in charge of the household. So 
just a reminder too, any, if anyone's been to the Middle East or everyone's even gone to like just kind of even a, a, a Middle Eastern restaurant, we know that none of the food is, is simply done. So it's not like she's by herself, which actually would have probably been better because she probably then would have kept her mouth shut a little bit more. But I'm going to go on a sort of my own Lexo Divina and, and sort of have a group of women who, by the way, know exactly what's going on. They know who Jesus is. They know who Mary Magdalene is, and they know the dynamics that are happening. Mary Magdalene should not have been in the room at the feet of Jesus. That was a, a, a pose that was a place for discipleship, for disciples. And as you know, still even in, our, in the Jewish tradition, men and women are often se separated in worship. So first of all, once again, you have Martha doing exactly what she's supposed to be doing, and you have Mary, if you will, kind of causing a, a scandal. So... Martha, and I'm just going to read from scripture here. Um, so as they continued their journey, Jesus entered a village where a woman whose name was Martha welcomed him. She had a sister, Mary, who sat beside the feet, at the Lord's feet, listening to him speak. Martha, burdened with much serving, okay, burdened, came to him and said, and this is the part I missed for a while. Um, she doesn't say, tell Mary to help me first. She says, Lord, do you not care? Well done, Martha, right? <laughs> well placed. I know. <laughs> Don't you love me? Don't you care? I kind of even have her going, Lord, do you not care? <laughs> Hopefully with like stains of blood on her, you know from the goat she had to kill. Um, do you not care? And I think this is very, that my sister has left me, has abandoned me, has, has just rejected me. I, I added those rest. She didn't put those in. By myself to do the serving. Okay. And I'm one of the bullet, like, we're all like, yeah. <laughs> Tell her to help me. Um, and I think what again, it's not just like she's making the meal, it's a lot of work. I think there's a lot of, of familial issues, a lot of emotions, probably even jealousy, and, and the desire for herself even to be with Jesus. I mean, I think we really, she's comparing herself to Mary. She's also realizing, um, th you know, that there's this, this opportunity that she might even be missing to be with our Lord, to be, to be there. And also, I'm going to go with thinking in the back, um, in the kitchen area, they're all kind of talking about it. She's talk And I would think even some of the men might even be in the corners of the room talking about it. And I just want to say something about Mary Magdalene here. I think it's important for us to also remember, like, I, I, more and more, you know, when I think about myself and what I'm embarrassed about of my own sins or where I feel I fail, um, you know, there's a part where I might be present in a room, but there's, there's a piece of me that kind of wants to just be hiding there sort of hidden in the back, or sometimes I think when we go into a church and we're not, we're struggling with something, I think a lot of us just like to be in the back row behind the pillar. We just sort of like that, like, I need to be here, but I'm not worthy, or I don't know what to even do. And I, I, don't, I, I don't think Mary is sitting at his feet, like front and center, going, everyone look at me. She's aware of who she is. I think she's kind of, kind of just quietly sitting, a very broken woman, a, a woman in pain, wanting to be near this holy man and wanting to listen to him. Now, this is the part I love when we have this face-to-face -face experience of Jesus and his mercy and his love with Martha. Um, again, we remember he says, I like Mary better. <laughs> Mary has chosen the better part. And this is what he says to her. First of all, and I think this is very intimate, he says, Martha, Martha. He, he calls her by name. And I think that's a very intimate thing we all know, the, the significance of our names. You are anxious and worried about many things, period. It's the end of the sentence. You are anxious and worried about many things. He really calls out what the issue is. It's, it, eventually he's going to say Mary has chosen. But the reality is Martha was pretty taken up in her own pride her own emotions, her anxiety and worry. The one thing, by the way, I think we all know this from scripture, um, 
I, I discovered it. I knew it was a lot of times, but I, was, I discovered um, through re- different readings that Jesus says, have no fear or do not be afraid what, or you know, do not be anxious and worried um, 365 times in scripture, in, in the, um, the gospels, which I was a little disappointed to find because that means there's one for every day. And that means, so we don't even get like one day we can justify being anxious, worried, and afraid. He thought of everything, really. Um, but I think, you know, how often we have, you know, Jesus saying, therefore I, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, not about your body or what you will wear, what you will put on. Um, do not be afraid. I mean, how often we hear these things, this, 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 this um, you know, this, this reminder, this sort of rebuke of there's nothing, not only, by the way, don't be afraid because it's bad, it's the opposite. It's, there's nothing to be afraid about. I'm here. I have faith. There's nothing to be, to fear. Um, so really, this opportunity where, I, and I, I just see Martha stopping, and really, she hears her name, she hears love say her name, and she stops and she realizes it's the anxiety and worry that are the problem. And the reason I really picked this up and, and realized it was not ever about the serving is because the last thing we're ever going to hear about Martha is she's serving a banquet for Jesus after Lazarus is raised from the dead. And I remember reading that years ago and going, whoa, 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 it should this is wrong. Scripture should say, you know, a banquet was thrown in, 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 in Bethany for Lazarus. Martha and Mary were sitting at the feet of Jesus. That's what it should have said because he yelled at her, remember? Yeah, last time for serving. And yet now she's serving again. So clearly I maybe had it wrong too. It was never about the serving, and which I think we can know because that's what the disciples are going to be called to do. Then he says, there is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part and it will not be taken from her. What is that one thing? It's listening at his feet in the pose of a disciple. You know, every time in scripture from all Old Testament to New, I think we all have to start to take a minute to remember the first part of discipleship or the first encounter that anyone is going to, the prophets or any of of those chosen are going to have with God is he's going to speak first and they're going to listen. You know, think of Elijah's in the cave waiting and waiting and waiting for something and then he's he's waiting to, to listen and it's that soft whisper that soft you know breeze comes in and and you know I, you moms in the room you know more than anybody when you're you ask your child to go do something and they don't listen to what you're asking I know that never happens but you're saying go in the other room and get me the book and then they come back with six books not the one you wanted or you know the the cup you know and you're just like now listen and then of course you don't want to yell at them right away because they did actually go in the other room and get the book but you know you you know with that idea of we have to listen first this Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus this call to discipleship which by the way as with everything with our Lord is radical women are not to be included typically in discipleship so everything Christ is doing is a whole new radical way of relationship he is calling for something that is going to take us out of our human level to a new divine spiritual level um Pope Benedict in um, 2010 spoke about this particular story in scripture and he says Christ's words are quite clear there is no contempt for the active life okay right this is good for us okay not even less generous nor even less for generous hospitality okay so this is not a you know this is not Jesus saying don't be active and don't be hospitable rather though it is a distinct reminder of the fact that the only real necessary thing is something else listening to the word of the Lord, and the Lord is there at that moment present in the person of Jesus. All the rest will pass away and will be taken from us, but the word of God is eternal and gives meaning to our daily actions. And I think that is something that we we need to be more aware of, is that we are supposed to be acting, we are supposed to be doing, but what's the meaning of it? Is it something where we can really enter into um, doing it for our Lord? Um, and I think, you know, for us, you know, in terms of our daily lives, this is where that gift of silence, that gift of prayer, that gift of how do we grow in a discipline of ourselves to, to be ready to really listen to him. And I think that's very hard, especially when our lives are very busy um, and we want, we want constant um, activity or, 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 or even affirmation. But that pose of silence, that, that, that sense of listening at, at his feet and how do we incorporate more of that into our lives to get rid of the anxiety and worry. Um, Cardinal Sarah, or Sarah, I'm sorry, I don't know exactly, um, who's from um, Guinea, has a beautiful, beautiful um, 
phrase that I had never heard before, and I just want to read this to you in terms of this call to silence and prayer. And I, he, it's very rich what he says. He says, we must often nestle close to the virgin of silence. I, and he's not actually speaking of the Blessed Mother. He's talking about this idea of silence being virginal. Um, to, let, to ask her to obtain for us the grace of loving silence and of interior virginity. Pureness, by the way. We're going to tell you, he says that. In other words, a purity of heart. You know, we think of virgin wool, virgin olive oil, virgin land. That purity and a willingness to listen and banish any presence except God's. I think that prayer calls somehow for an absence of words because the only language that God really hears is the silence of love. And I think for women, this is a tremendous, tremendous um, um, difficulty for us because we are so gifted and verbal, um, but also um, something that I think we know very well and that we know our deep desire for. Okay, now, um, again, we know that Martha is going to serve later after Lazarus is raised from the dead. I then I'd like to look at what happened between that first banquet and when Lazarus is raised from the dead. And I just want to look at that for a moment because I think for us, this is really where, um, where we get tested and where we are not just tested, but then also given an invitation to grow in a very profound intimacy with our Lord and with our faith. And I think what we know happens in between those two moments is Lazarus's illness and death. And so what we have now is, um, as all of us know, this profound, very painful and difficult life experience of, of suffering. So whether that be a death, whether that be um, some traumatic experience, whether that be an illness um, for us or a loved one, um, whether that be um, bro a broken heart from, from the loss of, of a child, whether physically or, or just the difficulties in family life, a divorce, a breakup, all of these things we know as a tremendous suffering, something that I don't know about you, but I wish we could avoid at all costs. And I think for all of us, when we are faced with suffering, I, I, often our first instinct is to get rid of it or to, to, to avoid it. And yet, I think time and time again, we're learning that it's really going to be through this painful, very difficult suffering experience that this intimacy, this face-to-face -face experience with Jesus um, really brings us to a whole new depth and a whole new level of faith and relationship to him. Um, I guess we know, I mean, again, to paraphrase, Lazarus is sick, Jesus knows, he doesn't come. When he arrives, Martha yells at him and says, if you were here, and then Mary does too, if you were here, he wouldn't have died, okay? And then Jesus does this great thing, and he raises Lazarus from the dead. Okay, now, the real story. Um, first of all, though, I, let's just say, she, Martha and Mary know what Jesus can do. Just a reminder of that. Like, they know he's going around and curing people who are sick. He know he's, they know he's multiplying bread and, and fish. They know he's, you know, probably at this time knows he's walked on water. They know what he's capable of and who, and who he is. And they know that he loves Lazarus, and if he comes, he'll just cure Lazarus, and it'll be quite simple. And I think there's something here that, you know, again, we have to think about. Each of us have had our experience of when we are pondering what's going on, what is God thinking? What is happening? And I think we can give Martha and Mary, um, a, you know, some understanding here of them saying, why isn't he coming? What is going on? Is he really who he says he is? Um, maybe there's tremendous doubt, tremendous fear. Maybe they wonder if he really even loves them. I, I, I think it, they're very human in this, and they're pondering this, and they also know their faith. So they also know they're trying to put together these pieces. Um, Martha heard that Jesus was coming, this is in John, um, she, and then she went out to meet him, but Mary sta stayed at home. And this is what I think is important for us to hear. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. I don't think she's yelling at him, actually. I think it's a statement because I think if it was, she was, now Mary later on says, comes out and is crying and sobbing and dramatic and says, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. Why didn't you come? So, but Martha, to me, this sounds more like a statement. And it gets, I think, more of that because of the way the conversation goes on. I think at some point in these days, she really had to come to make a decision. And, to, a de and she had a profound faith experience, which was a gift of realizing she knows if he had come, he would have cured Lazarus. But she also knows 
he's God. And whatever he's going to ask God even now is going to be about God, is going to be for God. That's a pretty profound leap and a pretty deep moment, which tells me she's been listening. She's had moments of silence. She's been pondering who Jesus is. And now at probably the most difficult, painful, and traumatic moment of her life, she can come out of herself and speak to him, to his face about this. Jesus says to her, your brother will rise. Martha says, and again, this is a profession of faith. I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And anyone, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And I think this is a very, very, very intimate, powerful moment. Think of the persons we love the most in our lives or the situations we have. She has the face of mercy. She has Jesus look her in the eyes and say, do you believe this? Do you believe in me? I, mean, I think every day when we say the creed and we say, I believe in God, the Father, we rattle it off. Imagine Jesus standing before us and looking and saying, do you, Sister Claire, believe what you're saying about me and about our faith? And she says, yes, Lord, I have come to believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. I think this is probably one of the most beautiful expressions and experiences of the mercy of God, of, of a very personal, intimate relationship with Jesus in the midst of the most brokenhearted moment Martha has experienced when she can say, I love you, I believe and, and, and I trust everything that you are about. To me, that's, that's a pretty high level of discipleship, of, of love and intimacy. And I think all of us who have love relationships in our lives know that's a very high level that we come to in our own relationships with spouses, with community, with friends, with family. Um, now, what is very interesting then, I think, for this next moment when we, we think about Martha and, and Jesus. And then Mar Mary comes out. And as bad as, as much as this part kind of made me cringe, probably because I identified with Martha, there was a part of me that had a little relief and sort of the idea like, this is great that she has this moment with Jesus, but um, she's so human and so like us and so, so Martha. So um, what we have happen is, um, again, Mary comes out. There's this moment. Jesus quite moved. We know, you know, he, he cries. He, he, the word is even used groans in prayer as he approaches the tomb of Lazarus. Okay. And then I think we remember the part, by the way, which I rediscovered recently because I didn't read the whole story because it, it makes me uncomfortable. Jesus says, take away the stone. Okay. And all of you, I already hearing some people are like, I know what comes next. It's awesome. Martha, the dead man's sister, says to him, Lord, by now there will be a stench. He has been dead for four days. I love it. You can't do that. It's going to smell. I know I just said you're God, but clearly you're not really that smart. And I know I want you to do something, but actually not that. Um, Sister Judith at the hospital had a little kid once, um, not happy, crying, throwing a tantrum. The mother kind of dragging him down the hallway. We, this is kind of a, a line in the convent now. And he's crying. He goes, this is not going to be pretty. <laughs> and I think that, to me, is exactly what Martha's saying. I mean, she's like, oh, whoa, this is not going to be pretty. And um, my house is going to smell now. I'm never going to get that stench out of the sheets. <laughs> but she's right. I mean, like, let's, I mean, give her a break for a second. It's been four days. They don't embalm here. You know, we're, we're and I love her because it's so, it's just so, you're like, that's hilarious, Martha. Um, and I, then, of course, God bless Jesus. But again, you know what, and this is where, as amusing as it can be, I think right there we can all feel this, truly this, this agonizing moment that she's just had. And I think what we all do when we, we kind of have these, these tremendous suffering moments, we want to control. 
we want um, maybe to manipulate the situation. We, I, I, like I know myself, you know, I remember um, you know, having a tremendous loss in my family, a, a brother dying, and I remember spending three hours reorganizing my parents' cupboards in the house. The couple of days, I thought, because at least I knew what to do. At least I could do something and I knew where things should go and reorganize. It was, was it a waste of three hours? Yeah, probably, and on one level, but I could control something. And I think we do that. We want to look with what we can control. And so Martha, instinctually in her humanness um, and in her practicality, wants to control what Jesus is going to do. And I think we can all relate to that. Jesus turns to her face to face and says, did I not tell you <laughs> that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Now, of course, I have him yelling at her. Did I not just say two minutes ago? You know. <laughs> But I'm sure Jesus didn't do that. He said, Mar, I'm sure he maybe even held her hands. <laughs> Probably not. But, um, <laughs> and, and, and really say, you know, we, we, I, I do. I know, I, as the priest, I expected to yell at me, being like, did we not, did you not know you're not supposed to do these things, sister? He didn't. He said, I'm so glad you're here. And I really believe Jesus did that with Martha. He, I, maybe he did grab, hold her hand and say, I, I, I told you how we can do this. We need to believe and trust and let go. And I, I think then, okay, and then clearly, um, she clearly has a moment of saying okay, um, because he does indeed. Um, they roll away the stone. Jesus raises his eyes and says, Father, I thank you for hearing me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd here, I have, this, I have said this, that they may believe that you sent me. By the way, a reminder, um, Jesus, they're after Jesus to kill him um, already. They have already decided they're going to kill him. And many have come to see what he does about Lazarus because they're looking for a reason to kill him. And later on in scripture, we'll say, after Jesus does this, it's completely decided that they're going to have him killed. And, quite, and they're also going to find a way to kill Lazarus uh, again, but to kill Lazarus. <laughs> okay. When he had said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out tied hand and foot with burial hands, and his face was wrapped in a cloth. So Jesus said to him, untie him and let him go. And, and by the way, just, uh, you know, I, I, I think there's something symbolic, you know, maybe it's just my own reading, but this, un, un, untie him, um, you know, take him out of his, what that which is binding him. And I, I kind of think this is something for, the, for that entire family of Bethany to hear, just this sort of like, you know, do not be tied to your fears. Do not be tied to sort of the human way of thinking. I, I'm releasing you. You're all being untied to a deeper faith, to a deeper intimate relationship with me. Um, you know, in closing, because I know I'm five minutes, four, four. Okay, sorry. She's been waving all this time. I, I do think this, this call now, um, you know, what we look at, this relationship, we look, look at Martha um, with some humor, but I, I want just to kind of go over what I really see as some essential characteristics of Martha, um, of, of that which God is asking her to, to grow in, that I really honestly think is, is something particular for each one of us in this room to, to grow and to deepen in, especially, you know, not only during this year of mercy, but always. And I, I think this is, again, if I could say anything, if we could leave here with this reminder of the, the joy of this constant conversion, this constant need, need for daily seeking mercy. And rather than looking at it as sort of the, the bad things we do that we've got to got, make right, can we start to look at mercy and our, our, our human failings, our sins, our vices, as our wounds, our sufferings, our pain, all of these things as aspects that, of course, that which make who we are, the women we are today, but also the place that Jesus is going to meet us. You know, when we look at when he's in encountering uh, Martha or when he's encountering the, those that are sick, those that are lame, those that are suffering, he's encountering them because they're suffering, because something's wrong, because something's disordered. And it's very interesting because, you know, when you think about it, and, and a lot of scriptures, uh, uh, theological writers talk about this, you know, he's not just, you know, a, so, a social worker. He's not someone who's coming to get rid of suffering. And I think we can know this very dominantly because he's going to suffer. I mean, clearly, if suffering wasn't something we were to experience, he would have eliminated it completely. In fact, what he does is he enters into it. 
and enters into it so much that he has wounds that he bears now, even in his resurrected body. And I think when we look at our own wounds, I don't know about you, but I often think wounds are something to get rid of, to be healed, not a place where I, I know something deep and intimate and, and a commonality with, with our God. And that, in fact, it's, it's in our wounds that, that Christ typically comes to meet us the most. Um, I remember once, I, I think it was a confession, making a, a, a talking about weakness, and I remember the, the priest used this, you know, that phrase, when we are weak, we are strong. Hate that one, too. Um, so in, actually, in, in all honesty, I, I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah, I don't like that one. And, um, and he went on, and I, and I honestly realized I didn't really understand what he was talking about. What do you mean my weaknesses are good? Like, I honestly didn't. Or, or, you know, to me, that was to be overcome. And I felt very justified in that years later when I actually used that quote to my dad. And he's like, I don't, what are you talking about? I don't, that doesn't make any sense. I'm like, it's scripture, I agree. It doesn't make any sense. Um, but I think it was a good reminder for me of, 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 I think in our family, that was something that was like, come on, like, suck it up, let's go, let's do it, get over it, you know, kind of thing. And so I think that reminder that it's, it's in Martha's weaknesses that she has these face-to-face -face encounters with Jesus even if they're not really very pretty. And yet this call he asks of her, of, her, of, of looking to, to Mary, of this, this reminder of this pose of discipleship, this pose of silence, this pose of listening and prayer. And I think, you know, we all know that. We all know the desire for prayer. But also our need to grow and understand our faith. I think that moment when, when, Mary, when Martha comes and meets Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus, there's clearly some depth of understanding of a profession of faith she's coming to. And I think a day like today, you know, different classes you might be taking, I, I, just a real challenge to all of us to take time to read about our faith, to start to read scripture. If we don't understand it or like it, to figure out um, what maybe Jesus is really saying. A, a, a time to really start to take um, the opportunities we can to learn more about our faith and, and to start to, to, to reflect on what does it mean to even profess that faith. Also, I have to say there's this great phrase I, I came up, up about and, um, and, and know um, this idea of sub, um, submissive boldness. And I, I don't remember exactly where I, I stole it from, but I stole it. And, um, and I love it because I, I think we don't ever put those words together, being submissive and bold. And I think we can honestly say there is something very bold about being, about surrender about that, that, that Marian, be it done unto me. That's a very brave, very strong, very bold thing to do. Mary at the foot of the cross is a very strong, strong woman. And she is allowing, she is being submissio within the mission of Jesus that our, that our God has asked. And I do think as women, there really is something very innate to us in, in terms of that, that ability to receive life, to allow life to be within us, which is, is really a submissive pose, a submissive way, um, yet the power, the strength, and the, and, and, and the boldness of being able to say yes to that and, and to bring forth that new life. Um, okay, I'm out of time. <laughs> Sorry, um, but it has been wonderful. I know we're going to have time for questions and answers. If you, is there anything I said that you want clarification on? Please put that in the questions and answers, and um, thank you very much. <laughs>